Good morning and welcome to TBC today. Welcome to everybody that's in the room and welcome to all of those who are watching at home. It's really great to know that we are a full church family worshipping together today. For anyone that's watching who doesn't know me, for anyone in the room who doesn't know me, I'm Astrid, I'm one of the ministers here. And um, Paul will be preaching a little later. He's one of the ministers also. Uh, and it's fantastic that worship's being led by Chris this morning. If you are new to us, and I'm looking around the room and I'm not seeing a lot of new people, but we still might have new-ish people who haven't filled out one of our Connect forms, can I encourage you to do that? And certainly if you're watching online, can we ask you to go to our website and to, um, to, to fill out the Connect form? This means that we can get to know you a little bit, and it means that you get to see our week bulletin if you, sh if you sign up for that and so on. So please do make yourself known. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are with us today. Lord, we thank you that you are present in this room. You're present in this space. You're present within our hearts. You're present within our lives. And Lord, we thank you for uh, the past week where you have been present with us. And now as we come to worship, whether we've had a challenging week or whether we've had an amazingly good week, Lord, I thank you that our collective experiences gather in the space where we are worshiping and you are with us. So Father, would you bless this time as we hear what you've got to say to us, Lord, as we're able to share our thoughts and our words with you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Chris in just two moments, but can I invite anybody who might describe themselves as being a senior I'm not going to make any faux pas by suggesting an age, but if you consider yourself to be a, a senior, you are invited to our seniors lunch, which is on, uh, it's two Wednesdays time here at TBC. I didn't uh, pick up the piece of paper that had the date on it. It is the 8th of December because I have a wonderful glamour assistant at the back of the church who is able to gesticulate. Um, she's also our amazing uh, chef. Uh, so she's got that date indelibly etched in her mind. But you are welcome to come, but I just need to know. So if you can text me or phone me or email me, then please let me know. And you are welcome to bring a neighbor or a friend. And all of my details are in our bulletin. So the connect form means that you can sign up for the bulletin, but if you haven't yet done that, we've got some paper copies out on the table there. For those at home, please um, just contact me whichever way you can. We'd love to have you with us. We be um, distancing a little bit to keep that space safe, but it's a great occasion. Now, Chris, I'm handing over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Astrid. Good morning. Um, great, great to have you with us. Great to have you with us at home as well. Um, if you'd like to stand with us, um, we're going to have a time of, of sung worship. Yeah. 
Faith be a song that overcomes. 
to take a seat. Thank you, Chris. Our younger children are going to go out to the creche now, so have a fantastic time, children. And thank you so much for those that are supporting and encouraging and, uh, and growing our kids. You know, isn't it amazing? I know their breakfast and their food grows our kids as well. But in terms of their hearts and their minds and, and um, encouraging them, in, in their faith, it starts so much out there as well as what we do as parents. If you read your bulletin last week, you will have read a story. Earlier in the week, I said to Paul, oh, I think I'm going to share this story Sunday. And he said, you didn't read your bulletin, did you? Because he shared it last week. So that's my, well, one of my confessions for the week. But maybe I'm not alone. Maybe others of us didn't read our bulletin. And even if you did, a good story is always worth telling twice. Many of us are aware that we work with um, two mission partners. Um, one is based in India, and one is based in the Philippines, and one is based 
in Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and Dignity is the, um, the, the organization that's based in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And they work establishing what they call life groups um, in whichever town or village they kind of find people that are receptive to the idea. A life group is um, a bit like a small group with go deeper stripes. They transform the local community. They work across churches. They work across um, families and, and people in that town or their village. For, ev for anyone that wants to come and know more about Jesus and to um, work with others to transform their community by supporting, uh, that becomes a life group. It's deeply, deeply relational. And John and Judith Witt, who head up the charity, they uh, shared a story on Facebook and then sent it out in their prayer bulletin. And it's from Zambia. And they've changed the name of the lady I'm going to speak about because they um, felt that that was appropriate. Um, but Tuwangi lives in Petoki. Zambia, and my apologies if I have pronounced any of that incorrectly. It's much easier to read it in your mind than it is to say it out loud. Um, traditional dancing happens in this community, and traditional dancing is carried out before the chiefs and the men of that community. Um, and for an outsider, that dancing can look extremely sexual, and that's because Sometimes it is. The young girls who participate in this dancing often have no say in what happens afterwards. And in this community, 15 young girls had been coming along to a life group that Tuongi and others run. And they say something amazing is unfolding because together, this group of young women have decided to resist the calls to participate in the dancing and everything that goes in it. Their involvement in the small community of people standing for Jesus has encouraged them to be able to say no to one of the traditions that takes place where they live. No one told Tuongi to help these girls take a stand. What's happening is a natural outworking of the knowledge and the relationship that these girls have with Jesus. And I just wonder, you know, with knowledge and faith and a little bit of community boldness, where Jesus might encourage us to take stands in the communities that we live in as well. So we're going to pray for Dignity, we're going to pray for Twongi and her life group now. But as we reflect on what's happening out in Zambia, just allow the Spirit to work in you. How might God be calling us to make a stand for the kingdom? Let's pray. Father, we love hearing story of where you are at work. We have just sung, your name, Jesus, is beautiful, and your name, Jesus, is wonderful, and your name, Jesus, is powerful. And Father, I thank you for the power that has been at work in this small community in Zambia, the power that has given a small group of young women, the courage to say no. Jesus is my king, and this is the way we are going to live our lives. And we're willing to turn our back on practices in our community that are not in keeping with the kingdom. Father, we pray for Tuongi and those that she is working with. We pray for these young women who have taken a stand. We pray for their families. We pray that you will cover 
any element of shame that might have been reflected across their families. Lord, we pray against any repercussions that they might experience as a consequence of them saying no. And Father, we pray that they might be a catalyst in their town and beyond. So Father, we thank you for the work of dignity. We ask you to bless John and Jude who are out in Africa at the moment and just pray that wherever they go, they not only will be a collector of these amazing stories of you at work, but they will be sowers into communities where new life groups can start to be birthed and start to grow and start to feed communities that may not yet still be living in the way that you would have them live. So watch over them, we pray. Watch over every life group leader. Lord, give them wisdom and sensitivity to your spirit so that when you say stand or go or rest or do, Lord, they will be receptive and they will be resourced to be able to follow the paths that you're leading them in. Lord, thank you for the privilege that we can partner with an organization that just refreshes our hearts and minds as we hear how you are working so many miles away. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer now. We're going to continue uh, in, in a reflective time, and we're going to use the Lord's Prayer to help us do that. Uh, many of us will have been brought up to recite the Lord's Prayer in a, in a quick and in a, a kind of liturgical way. So I'm going to confuse you today because we're going to use the Lord's Prayer as it's written in the message. And we're going to pause after every sentence. And we're just going to allow a little time for God to speak to us through those words. So the words will come up on the screen. And I encourage you to share them out loud if you feel comfortable doing that. But then we will just have a time of, of quiet for God to speak to us. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven... Reveal who you are. Let's spend a moment asking God to reveal himself to us. Abba, Daddy. Set the world right. Do what's best as above, so below. Let's quietly bring situations that are local or global. God, those that you're concerned for. Do what's best, Lord, as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Let's thank God for the way that he provides for us. Let's remember those in need. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. 
So who have you forgiven recently? Is that relationship good in your heart? And who might you need to forgive further? Who's forgiven you recently? Bless them with for their grace. Receive God's forgiveness where you yourself have sinned. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. So spend a moment reflecting on where you're tempted to sin. What are your battles? Let's submit these areas of our lives to God and ask him for protection and ask him to make us bolder in taking a stand against the enemy's schemes. God, you're in charge. You can do anything you want. So let's continue to quietly reflect on who God is, almighty, all-knowing, prince of peace. And maybe we can call out single words that speak of who God is to us today. Let's join in together out loud with the words on our final sl slide. Let's call this out. Uh, in fact, let's stand and pray these words. God, you're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. We're going to stay singing, uh, standing as we sing.
Thanks, Chris. Good morning. It's lovely to see you all. Um, we're going to uh, start off with reading from uh, the Old Testament from the book of 1 Samuel. So I would encourage you to follow along in your Bible. If you've brought a Bible with you, or uh, if you haven't, you ought to be able to see one of these under a seat somewhere near you. Um, do follow along with the passage when somebody's up here speaking, because otherwise I could be talking any old nonsense, couldn't I? Uh, I've only got something to say if it's coming out of here. Uh, if you've got a red Bible, we are going to be on page 300, so that's nice and easy to find. And I'm going to start reading from verse 3 of chapter 28. Just while you're finding your places, we've been in a series over the last few weeks looking at the lives of the first three kings of Israel in the Old Testament. So we've mainly been in the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to get into 2 Samuel eventually um, and looking at what we can learn for today from the lives of those three kings. So 1 Samuel 28, starting at verse 3. Now Samuel was dead. And all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all the Israelites and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord. But the Lord did not answer him, by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium so that I may go and inquire of her. There's one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up the one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He's cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for me to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a spirit coming up out of the ground. What does he look like? He said. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams, so I've called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, why do you consult, consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbours, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both, Is both Israel and you to the Philistines. And tomorrow... You and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. Immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he'd eaten nothing all that day and night. 
When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your maidservant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so that you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him, and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at the house, which she slaughtered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night, they got up and left. Our daughter Jess um, learned to speak when she was, I guess, coming up for two years old, somewhere around there. And about five minutes after she learned to speak, she learned to wheedle. And I think that's just a built-in feature with children, isn't it? The, the, The idea that if you don't get the answer you want, then the correct procedure is to ask again. And again. And again. And again, and as she, I'm I'm sure my child isn't the only one that does this. Somebody nod at me. This is not just Jess, is it? Um, And as she grew up, she got a little bit more sophisticated about it. And instead of the the original, please, 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 it kind of, it got slightly more sophisticated. She would go away and leave it a few hours. And then when I had forgotten that she had ever asked the question, she would come back and she would say, Dad you know you love me. And I would reply, Jessica, my daughter, what you need to understand is this. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of your dad stands forever. I didn't say that at all. I should have said that. I I didn't say that. Um, It came to her head when she was, I think, seven or eight years old, and she really, really, really wanted a kitten. And uh, she, she mithered at us for a long time to get a kitten. And uh, we, for a while, we got away with it. Because what we'd say is, what Astrid would say is, the thing is, Dad's allergic to cats. So if we got a cat, Dad would have to go and live in the shed. And you wouldn't <laughs> want that, would you? And for a long time, Jess would say, no, I wouldn't want that. Until one day... My darling daughter said, we could take dad meals in the shed, couldn't we? (laughs) And then the next day, she showed us a PowerPoint, an actual PowerPoint that she had created herself, talking about how wonderful it would be if we had a cat. And at that point, her mother crumbled. Um, (laughs) There are times when it is okay to keep asking God about something. There are times when he positively encourages us to keep on asking. Jesus said that to his followers, didn't he? He talked about being persistent in prayer. He told a story about a woman who pestered a judge to get justice against somebody that had become an anniversary of hers. And the woman got on to the judge again and again and again. And Jesus told that story to show us that it's okay to be persistent in prayer. He told a story about a friend turning up at a friend's house late at night and knocking on the door, and the friend saying, I'm in bed, clear off. And he kept knocking, or she kept knocking on the door, and eventually, because they kept knocking, their friend got out of bed and gave them the food that they wanted. And he told that story to tell us that there are times that it is okay to keep on knocking on God's door, if you like. It is all right to pester God in prayer. He doesn't mind how many times we come back. In fact, he he enjoys, he likes us to be persistent. And there's probably a hundred different places in the Bible which talk about us continuing in prayer, pressing into God, praying until something happens. That's a good thing to do. But there's another kind of occasion. When God has spoken, And to get under the the skin of what's happening in the passage I just read in in 1 Samuel 28, you need to know what happened a few chapters earlier in 1 Samuel 15, when God had given King Saul some very, very specific directions. God had spoken. Saul was going into a battle, and God told him, you're going to win. 
And when you win, you have got to slaughter all the livestock of these people who you're going to defeat in battle. And Saul won the battle, and then he looked at all the sheep, and he looked at all the cattle, and he thought to himself, maybe I'll just keep some of the nicer ones for myself and for my troops. And then Samuel the prophet rocked up and he said, what's going on? What are all these sheep? What are all these cattle? What's happening? What have you done with what God said? And Saul tried to rationalise his behaviour, which is this thing they, they used to do in Bible times when they knew that they disobeyed God, and they just tried to find a way to explain it away. Of course, we don't do that these days. Listen to, to uh, what, um, Saul, well, no, what Saul said in 1 Samuel 15 was, yeah, you don't understand, Samuel. I was only keeping them so I could slaughter them as, um, as sacrifices to God. I was doing the right thing, really. I was, doing, I was doing something good. This is Samuel's reply from 1 Samuel 15. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams, for rebellion is like the sin of divination. Saul could have written that bit down and saved himself a lot of trouble a bit later on, couldn't he? Rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And then a couple of verses later, Samuel goes on and says this, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbours, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he is not a human being that he should change his mind. There was no room for confusion. God had spoken. And when God speaks, wheedling stops. Pestering stops. Asking again and again in the hope that he might forget what he has just said and give us a different answer has to stop. And we could probably save ourselves so much heartache if we just accepted that when God has spoken, he doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind. He has spoken. And that's the background that we need to keep in mind. That's from, what's that, 13 chapters earlier in, in the book of 1 Samuel. That's the background that we need to keep in mind when we come to the story that I've just read in 1 Samuel 28. And in 1 Samuel 28, what we read is that the Philistines had gathered, gathered their army at Shunam. And that's close to Nazareth, where, where Jesus grew up, in the north of the country. So that's a little way north of Jerusalem. And Saul and his army set up camp facing off with this army of the Philistines. David wasn't around at this point because Saul had hunted him down and made him a fugitive. And so Saul had to lead the army himself. And he was terrified. And on top of that, Samuel the prophet, who had always been there advising Saul, even if he didn't want to hear it, Samuel the prophet had died. And Maybe that was it. Maybe God had spoken to Saul through Samuel so many times, and now Samuel wasn't there anymore. And perhaps Saul thought to himself, I know what God said, but that was before he saw this Philistine army. I know what God said, but now Samuel's not here, so perhaps God will see it differently. And so he inquired of the Lord. And it says he inquired of the Lord through dreams. We understand what those are. And through Urim and prophets. Uh, we don't actually know for absolute definite what Urim is. It, it's mentioned a few times in the Old Testament. Um, normally in conjunction with another word, which is Thummim. And so there are these two things, Urim and Thummim. And the best that Bible scholars can tell is that they were two objects that were used when they cast lots to try and work out what God was saying. So they may have been like some kind of dice or something else. We're not 100% sure. But there was something used when they cast lots to try and work out what God was saying to them. But the point is that Saul went back and asked God for a different answer over something he had already pronounced about. Saul went back and asked God 
for a different answer. I do that. I know I do that. I do it in all sorts of areas of my life. I, I've been trying to lose a bit of weight recently, and uh, I started doing something that I've never, literally never done in my life before, which is standing on the bathroom scales each morning. And I find myself doing these crazy things, because there are some times that I look down and I see the number, and I do not like the number that I see. And so I try standing on one leg. Or I find myself thinking, perhaps if I breathe out all the way, or, or, or perhaps if I... Forget it, Paul. The scales have spoken. And I need to get out of my place of denial and accept what they have said. How much more when God has spoken? How much more when God has spoken? When I know that God has spoken to me, and yet I find myself thinking, perhaps if I just explain the situation to him, perhaps if he sees that I'm really struggling with this, perhaps he meant it back then, but maybe, maybe he sees it a bit differently now. I mean, I, I can rationalise a good argument for literally anything, and so can all of you. But there are times that you know that God has spoken. There are times that you know that God has spoken. And while we're at it, there are also times that I don't ask God because I know full well what he's going to say and I don't want to hear it. And they probably are for you too. But if you know that God has spoken, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. You know that he's spoken. So Saul asked God to speak to him about something that he had already pronounced about. And surprise, surprise, God stayed quiet. And when God didn't give Saul the, the, the different answer that he was hoping for, Saul said to his attendants, find me a woman who's a medium. Desperate people do desperate things, don't they? Did you ever hear God speaking and then go looking for a second opinion? Did you ever get to a place where you know God has spoken to you, but you go looking for a second opinion somewhere else? Did, it, did God ever say something to you that you didn't want to hear, and so you went to Facebook for a different opinion? Did God ever say something that you didn't want to hear, so you went to your friends to see whether any one of them would give you the answer that you did want to hear? Because it only takes one person to say what you want to hear to make you feel justified inside and to quieten that nagging voice from your conscience that keeps reminding you that God has already spoken about this. Did God ever say something to you that you didn't want to hear? And so you looked around to see what most people do these days, because after all, it is the 21st century. You know, the sad thing is that once upon a time, Saul had been a half-decent king. There was a time when he'd led the nation into following God's laws, some of them at least. There was a time when he'd banned spiritists and mediums. There was a time when he'd upheld God's laws. But then the day came when Samuel was gone and David was exiled and the Philistines were massing their armies just north of his capital city. It's so easy to stick to your guns when you're sitting in an armchair. But what counts is what comes out when it comes to the crunch. And when Saul hit his crunch moment, he put on a disguise to pretend he wasn't who he was and he went right back to the very thing that he'd tried to eradicate from his life. Now, we need to talk about this next bit, don't we? Because uh, this, this next bit, let's be honest, this next bit is weird. Can we acknowledge that? There are a few stories in the Bible where we probably feel a little bit more comfortable if they just weren't in there at all, because they just don't fit with the way we see the world. Um, but it seems quite clear that what was happening here is that Saul takes part in some kind of forbidden occult ritual 
and actually had a conversation with the spirit of the dead prophet Samuel. That seems to be what was going on in this story. And there's an almost comic scene that unfolds with Saul in disguise in some mystic, occultic place in the middle of the night, in the dark, with Saul nervous and disguised in incognito, and this woman who is a practitioner of the dark arts performing some kind of arcane rituals. And I'm paraphrasing things very slightly here, but out of the ground rises the shadowy form of the spirit of Samuel, who looks Saul straight in the eye and says, you're an idiot. What has God already said to you? You're an idiot. Do you really think I'm going to tell you something different from what I told you when I was alive? God has already spoken. Don't make me tell you again. But what Saul was actually doing was no laughing matter at all. And it's something that we, we don't talk about that often in church. Maybe we should talk about it before. But there are spiritual practices mentioned in the Bible that come with extremely serious health warnings. Practicing divination, seeking omens, consulting mediums, people today sometimes call that channeling, practicing sorcery or magic, looking to the stars for guidance or predictions. Yes, that means astrology. All of these things are things that God says, do not touch. And sometimes Christians have interpreted that as meaning that these things are not real. The Bible doesn't comment on that, doesn't talk about whether they're real or fake, doesn't talk about whether they work or whether they don't. It says they are toxic to your spirit. They are poison to your soul. Do not touch. They will mess you up, is what the Bible says. Because at their heart, they're all attempts to approach spirituality whilst bypassing God. They're all attempts to get in touch with something spiritual while bypassing God. Many of them are about trying to find out truth or insight or guidance or predictions of the future whilst bypassing God. And what God says, what the Bible says, is that doing that will leave you wide open to some truly dark and evil powers. Don't mess with this stuff. And so this passage really is Saul at the very bottom of the barrel. It's the lowest of his low points. He tried to work his way around God, and God will not be worked around. He is supreme, and he is absolute. And it's become unfashionable to say this sort of thing in the modern world because everything is so relative and everything has to be so equivocal and we're so afraid of causing offence. But God is above all and before all and over all and he will not be second-guessed and he will not be worked around and he will not share the first place in our lives that he deserves with anyone or anything else. He won't. God spoke to Saul, and Saul went looking for a second opinion somewhere else. And over, uh, they did that over a course of years, not just in this incident, and he lost his joy, and he lost his peace, and he lost the presence of God, and he lost God's voice. And sometimes, when we recognize that we've lost our joy, or our peace, or God's voice, or the presence of God, sometimes we need to look back and say, when was it that God spoke? And I went looking for a second opinion. When was it that God spoke and I tried to find a way of working around him rather than obeying what he said? Let's identify our efforts to get a second opinion when God has spoken for what they are. And let's identify our attempts to, to work around God for what they are. And let's turn back. Because God is still the loving father of the prodigal child. You only need to take a single step back towards him for him to come running towards you and embrace you and draw you back. He won't ever do to us what he did to Saul, which is to reject him completely. Because that's what Jesus has brought us on the cross. 
but we can still put ourselves in a place where we are separated from him because God has spoken and we've tried to work around him or we've tried to get a second opinion somewhere else. Let's take that step back. When did God speak to you? Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. I'm going to do what we often do and invite you in a moment to stand with me if, uh, if you want to respond. And um, I actually mean with me. God's really challenged me as I've prepared this and I'm standing in response to my own sermon. And if you want to stand with me, if you know that there are things that God has spoken to you about and you've kind of left that behind, then I'd encourage you to stand with me. It's not a shameful thing, it's a positive thing. So if, if you need to respond, if you need to say to God, yeah, I remember you speaking, and I see that I've found other ways around, then stand with me now. If you're at home watching, then you can stand, or you can just acknowledge to God that this is you too. Holy Spirit, would you come and visit us now? We know you're here. Just pray that you'd make your presence felt, that you would make your voice heard. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we see in the story of Saul a man who lost so much. He lost his peace, he lost his joy. He lost his relationship with you. He lost his sense of your presence. He lost his ability to hear your voice. And Lord, some of us have lost some of that as well. And for some of us, we know that there have been times that you have said something to us. And we've tried to find a way around that. We've tried to find a different answer somewhere else. And Lord, we come to you this morning in repentance. And we come to you confessing our sin. And we come to you knowing that you are the God who overflows with grace and forgiveness. And that as we take a step towards you, you take a hundred steps towards us. And we thank you for your grace. Thank you that because of Jesus, we never get to the state that Saul got to. But Father, we don't even want to be three steps down that road towards where he got to. And so we pray that you'd meet with us now. Lord, take us back, whether we're standing or not, take us back to those times when you've spoken and strengthen us to be obedient to you. Give us the humility to set ourselves aside and to live your way. And Holy Spirit, I want to pray that you would restore the time that we've had where we haven't felt your presence, that you would restore your voice, that you'd restore that sense of your presence with us. That we would know that you've brought us back home. So Holy Spirit, would you come, would you... Minister your forgiveness, minister your grace, minister your healing, and minister your restoration. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Am I handing back to you or Chris?
we're going to stand together and sing um, our final song before we then close our service. So, if you'd like to stand with us and sing, we're going to sing before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. brings us to the end of our service. Um, if you'd like to pop something into the offering baskets, we would really appreciate it. There should be one either door. If you'd like to sign up for a direct debit to give to the church, uh, please do um, have a chat to somebody on the leadership team as well, and we can help you sort that out. Um, we're going to... Um, go through for coffee in a moment, but maybe I can just pray with you before we leave.